Willis said to me uh, at one point, he said, well, if that's what you think business has to do, what do you think it would take to do it? I said, well, three things. First of all, you'd have to shift the consciousness Mm -hmm. of the existing business leadership. So it saw itself as a steward rather than a predator. Yeah, And I love that quote. I love that comment. Yeah, because it's true. I mean, business as a predator is a dangerous animal. Absolutely. But as a steward, you're responsible for what you do. Mm-hmm. The second category was to shift the consciousness of young people going into business. So they see themselves entering a noble profession. The price of liberty okay, is an informed citizenry. If you're not willing to get informed, mm-hmm. you're not going to be free. Welcome to Living in Santa Barbara. I'm your host, Kathy Henry, and today you'll be introduced to Ronaldo Brutico, a passionate advocate for our community and the world. Ronaldo is the founder of the World Business Academy, a nonprofit think tank focused on ethical leadership and sustainability in business. His mission is to shift business consciousness toward addressing critical moral, environmental, and social issues. My original intent was to focus on the presentation he gave on 360 Degrees of Consciousness at the Vibrant Living Series at Unity of Santa Barbara. You can find this talk on YouTube under the World Business Academy channel. The link will be in my podcast description. Ronaldo is a man who speaks from the heart, and during this podcast, he'll express his thoughts and opinions on politics and the upcoming election. I wasn't prepared to discuss politics. However, given recent events, I understand why it's top of mind, and he felt compelled to bring it up. Also, this podcast was recorded before the unfortunate event that occurred in Pennsylvania. Whether you agree or disagree with his opinions, he shares them out of a genuine concern for all of humanity, and his views do not necessarily reflect mine or those of the podcast. However, this podcast aims to be thought-provoking and share stories about people who are taking action as stewards of the community, the nation, and the world, and that is Ronaldo Brutico. I try to avoid discussing politics on this podcast and only hope to inspire you to stay informed and take action for positive change. Now, let's dive into today's episode with Ronaldo Brutico. Hi, Ronaldo. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks My for pleasure. being on the podcast. I got introduced to you through Unity of Santa Barbara, and I went to the, what's it called? Living, Vibrant Vibrant Living Living. Series. Yeah. And I was really impressed. (laughs) My first thought was he should run for president. (laughs) You had the idea of the third party observer, Mm -hmm. and you also had the, the three ways of prospering economically, socially, and spiritually. So wherever you want to start. Well, I think, first of all, thank you for the compliment. The interesting thing that everybody sort of knows but forgets is we only go through this once. So the question really ought to be, uh, what's the best way to spend your time while you're here? Mm -hmm. And I learned a long time ago that the best way to do that is to ask a simple question. And the question is, how can I serve? So if you ask that question, how can I serve? What happens is you start thinking about, well, what does that mean exactly? And for me, that started with an observation that the universe is so complex and so extraordinary that we are obviously a very small cog and a very, very giant set of wheels. And so to not be aware Mm -hmm. that something bigger than me is going on would be kind of brain dead. So people kind of get that. But then they're afraid to go to the next step, which is, okay, so then what should we do about it? Do we ignore the bigger than me reality and just try to live our life basically satisfying whatever wants and needs we experience in the moment? Or should we set our mind to something that makes a difference? Mm -hmm. So when you ask, how can I serve? What you're really saying is this bigger world is happening in the universe. How can I fit into it better with what my lifetime could conceivably contribute to it? And if you ask that genuinely, and you're really seriously genuine about it, you'd be surprised what the answer comes back. And very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. I never know what the answer is going to be every time I ask that question. But I do know that's the right question because it keeps me grounded in a multidimensional reality. Mm -hmm. So you referenced a minute ago, spiritual, economic, and uh, social. Well, the truth is, if you're grounded in those three realities, you are going to find yourself in very interesting places all the time. And it's impossible for anything to go really, really wrong because you're always going to be in place where you felt good about what your contribution was. You know, the question is, 
are we even going to be able to survive as democracy? What's going on? Question. <laughs> Good question. By the way, I want to say that there are more than two candidates. <laughs> People forget. Well, there are, but there are only two that have a chance of winning at this point. And I mm -hmm. think that that's a mistake. I think there should be more than two candidates that have a chance of winning. And I also think that the public ought to be more involved than it is right now in that selection. Part of the problem the public has with political factor figures, even good ones, who there's no question Joe Biden has a phenomenal record. But what he did on the debate would cause anyone to be concerned about his ability to defeat Trump. Might even cause people to doubt he had all of his marbles. But then again, when he did the Stephanopoulos show a couple of days later, I mean, that wasn't so good either. That wasn't exactly a success. No. You know, he'd stumble around on a lot of things there, including saying he was going to work his goodest as opposed to his best. <laughs> he said that. I didn't did, know yeah. that. Yeah. So does that mean he's over the edge around the bend? No, but it's it's causing there to be a question and we can't afford a yeah. question now. No. There's too much at stake. So what I think he needs to do is what uh, George Washington did after two terms. And when he said that he would step aside. And my goal would be to have Biden, who has a tremendous history, to acknowledge that and to, and, and I, we've just created it at the World Business Academy. I know you're interested in that. We just did a memo that, day after the, the debate. debate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we're circulating it now. We're proposing that Biden host a, an eight-part reality show and that the each part is Biden interviewing one of the prospective candidates for president on the Democratic side. Oh, that would be interesting. And at the end of that interview, everybody gets a chance to, in, in the public. To as long as it's authentic. Well, of course it'd have to be. And, and with Joe, it would be. Joe's a very authentic guy. I think the problem is that he's being protected too much by the political establishment. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with you on that, just because of what I saw at the debate. I don't think that that was authentic. The, no, the I don't think, yeah. no, I don't think he was. I think he was clearly in bad shape. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that his people let him on the stage in that condition, whatever the reason. But putting that aside for a moment, I don't think it was just a unique moment. It's a one bad day kind of no, moment. No, I don't think so either. It's indicative of something deeper. Yes. So my point is that Joe would then interview, and, and Joe apparently is still quite good with international relations. He's apparently pretty good at remembering what it is he has to do in the job. So have him interview each of the candidates that are you know major contenders. He can pick them okay. and tell the public that it, he's going to make the final decision. It's his. He's got the 900 delegates. But he'd like to know what the public thinks. And we've arranged for the largest polling firm in America, the mm -hmm. one that does the polling for The Voice and other shows like that. And they're willing to actually run a, a poll for a, a vote for us. So you, the World Business Academy has gotten involved with you. You have connections mm -hmm. and have suggested this to yeah. the yeah. party. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so, the and, and, you know, you can't force it on the Democrats establishment. But yeah. basically... We've been circulating and we're starting to get some real good feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, James Carville did not know what we wrote, but in the New York Times this morning, he basically said the same thing we said, which is he needs to have an open process. Yes. So then if he interviews each of these eight people and at the end of the eight shows, think of how good he will look saying, I'm stepping down for the good of the country. People mm -hmm. are going to love that. They'll forgive him his errors and they'll say, hey, OK, the guy's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. They get a chance to hear from each of the other seven candidates, eight candidates. And then they um, get to vote. And I think you should make it clear the vote is not determinative. In other words, the public might vote for somebody that he doesn't want to be the president. Yes. And it will be his decision. But at least he'll know what the public thought. Mm -hmm. And the public should have a voice in this. The mm -hmm. fact that the Democratic establishment is trying to sort this all out internally. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's just it's not what they claim they're about. Right. They claim that they're about an open system. So, OK, yes. make a transparent system. Yeah. And let the people speak. Mm -hmm. Let people have a choice. And they do that. It will be revolutionary. Wait, whose idea was this? Was this yours? Yeah, no, it started with Robert Shelton, actually. Okay. Uh, and when Robert talked to me about it the day after the debate, I really encouraged him, gave him some feedback. I just talked to him a few minutes ago on the phone. Yeah. So Robert's a vice president of the academy. He and I have been together for about 20, oh gosh, 26, 27 years now in one way or another. And um, I said, Robert, that's a fabulous idea. Why don't we flesh that out? Why don't, mm -hmm. we, why don't we write it up as an academy memorandum? And let's see, circulate it and see how many people would be interested in having an open selection process. Yeah. And we specifically recommend that that um, not occur until after the Republican convention. So don't get caught up in all the political hoo-ha. 
Mm-hmm. Just wait till the convention's over and then put Biden on TV for seven or eight n- nights, each time interviewing another candidate. Mm-hmm. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, he blew it with 50 million viewers. Yes. So he's got to get at least 100 eyeballs back, 100 million eyeballs back. You know, and, and he's got to do it in a way that's going to impress. Interesting. That's interesting. A different, a unique yeah. idea. Yeah, it's totally unique. And what yeah. I, love, the part I loved about it, which I said to Shelton when we came up with this, I said, you know, this is great. Biden is a reality TV show is going to really tick off Trump, who's a reality TV show. That's was- funny. Are you guys, are, do you guys have fun with these ideas? Does- of course we do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, so it's funny. like um, you get a call from me and it's not outside the box. Oh, no. It wasn't me calling. That is so funny. <laughs> okay. So can you tell us about the World Business Academy? Sure. Yeah. Sure. The World Business Academy was started in 1986 mm-hmm. as a nonprofit, still is a nonprofit. I have served as the nonpaid CEO for all that time since 1986. Did the, you start it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I started it uh, in, in a conference room with my partner at the time, was a guy named Willis Harmon. And Willis was a very famous guy. Many people around the world knew Willis and, and a, a genius. I mean, he was, he's the guy who invented artificial intelligence, by the way. He, wow. He, he, was, he was the first person to ever teach it. He taught it at Stanford University in the engineering department okay. in 19, I'm going to say 69 or earlier even. So anyway, he became very famous and long story short, he became the senior futurist in residence for about uh, 16, 17 years at Stanford Research Institute. Mm-hmm. Right? Pulled him out of Stanford to put him there. Was he a partner in your law firm? Is that no, no. He was a friend of a friend who got introduced to me because that friend had heard me say some things like I said the other night. Mm-hmm. And You got to meet this guy. Yeah, yeah. you got to meet each other. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so he came over to dinner. And at the end of the dinner, we chatted privately. And he said, so, Ronaldo, what do you think it takes? Because I made the case that if the business community doesn't get fixed, nothing mm-hmm. is going to get fixed. Mm-hmm. And that's not hubris, that's because business is just too powerful as an institution. Mm -hmm. But it's also because business is the only institution in society which is has its basic DNA to deal with change. So academic institutions don't deal with change. They Mm -hmm. deal with looking at the past and try to project in the future. Yes. Political forces don't deal with change. They deal with consensus. So that's a whole different issue. So when you start looking around, who are the institutions in society that could have impact because we were clearly going in the wrong direction would have to be business. They've got to change. And if business changes because they put up all the money in those days, then you'd get a different result. And one thing would lead to another. You'd have a country really wanted to live in. Mm-hmm. So I, Willis said to me uh, at one point, he said, well, if that's what you think business has to do, what do you think it would take to do it? I said, well, three things. First of all, you'd have to shift the consciousness. Mm-hmm. of the existing business leadership. So it saw itself as a steward rather than a predator. Yeah, And I love that quote. I love that quote. Yeah, because it's true. I mean, it, it, business as a predator is a dangerous animal. Absolutely. But as a steward, you're responsible for what you do. Mm-hmm. The second category was to shift the consciousness of young people going into business. So they see themselves entering a noble profession. Mm-hmm. Well, when you think you're in a noble profession, that's like you robe for the temple, not the jungle. Yeah, And every time you look in the mirror and you put on your suit and tie or your business outfit, whatever it is, your, your dress, whatever, that particular thing is a reflective moment. You go, okay, I'm getting dressed. What am I getting dressed to do? Go out and commit hairy uh, crimes in the jungle? Or am I getting dressed to, to serve society in the temple of humanity? How are you going to do that now with all this influencers making tons of money well, doing? <laughs> well, let me go to the third thing. And the third thing is shift the consciousness of the public at large. So they put their money where their deeper values are. Yeah. So you got to do all three. of them. If you do all three of those, then it will happen. So Willis turned to me and said, okay, if you believe that's what should happen, why don't you do it? And I said, well, Willis, if somebody of your intelligence, you are clearly incredible goodwill, your huge heart, your huge capacity. If you help me do it, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. So he said, okay, we shook hands, and that was the beginning of the World Business Academy. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, that's how it started. Now, to influence your question, the influence question is an interesting one. It is clearly an enormous challenge, and we haven't begun to wrap our arms around it yet, even a little bit as a society. And he left out of it the other huge challenge, which is a generative artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. So when um, you combine those two, these are massive social forces that have to be countered in a successful way, not defeated, but shaped and channeled. 
Now, you asked the question in regard to young people going into business. And if you think about it, and we've spent a lot of time in the academy writing, I've written four books, at least two of them have been taught in business schools. And I've done a lot of guest lecturing at Stanford Business, Kellogg, Keenan Flagler, Case Western, University of Barcelona, I mean, a whole bunch of different places. And, and every time I go in and meet with the students there, in any context, and I, I haven't done this now for years, but when I used to do it, I was always taken, uh, I was impressed by the level of mental acuity. Yeah. And I was depressed by the level of social awareness mm-hmm. or EQ. And it occurred to me that the business schools needed to have a different dimension, which, by the way, Kellogg does. I think Stanford has a little bit of it. There are places like Wharton that intentionally don't have it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's a quant school. In um, this place like Keenan Flag that intentionally harbor it. So there are educational institutions for young people going into business, business schools, MBAs, that are actually addressing this question. And I think making a lot of headway because they're trying to integrate what does it mean to be responsible for society and also be profitable? Yeah, but the thing is, is that those people are going into business, but I think that there's less young people that are going into business. Well, when I was young, which is a long time ago, it was even more so the case. In other words, when I went into business, which I was never intending to do going through law school, nobody that I liked, that liked what I liked, what I called the people of the heart, mm-hmm. nobody wanted to go into business. In fact, it got to the point where I said, you know, if some of us don't go in there, look what we're going to have. Yeah. Look who's going to be left running everything. Mm-hmm. We got to go. And I, I gave a speech today. We got to go learn white man's ways. We got to go learn what it is that they are doing that we want to do differently. And that means we got to go do our homework. How do they do what they do? And why is it important? And how do we make it work better? So that's what really led me into business. And I can honestly say I've never had a legitimate job in my life. I mean, I've never gone to work to get a paycheck. I've always said, okay, what am I here to do? How can I serve? And when the answer comes back, if it's, I get paid, I get paid. If it comes back, I don't get paid. I don't get paid. So it's either nonprofit, which is okay with me, or it's for profit. And I don't distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. And that's very unusual because people usually want to take care of themselves first and then everybody else second. Mm -hmm. And I never thought that was a very wise position. So, but back to the point about the young people. So yes, we've gone through these phases where young people go, oh, it's so dirty and terrible. And everybody wants to go in. And that is a popular view, but it's becoming less and less true. One of the things that we did in the academy 10 plus years ago is we launched a a division called Just Capital. And Just Capital, now it's 10 plus years old, has spent on average about $13 million a year Mm -hmm. researching the thousand largest public companies in America. Every year we rank Mm -hmm. by how well they're doing as a just company. And the way we determine what's just is we ask 25,000 new interviews every year. We've now done about 200,000. Knowing who the biggest companies in America are very simple. You can go to any number of indexes. You can go to the New York Stock Exchange. You can go to, you can go to um, any okay. NASDAQ. You can go okay. to uh, the business lines. There's a million places to go. Bottom line, it's determined by their capital size. Right. So the bigger the capital size, the, the larger they are. So we go and we, we go and investigate all those thousand companies mm-hmm. every year, mm-hmm. fresh. And we are armed with these 200,000 interviews we've now done. And we add 25,000 new ones every year because the public is changing its point of view all the time. Mm -hmm. And you want to keep current with what the public thinks Mm -hmm. would be just corporate behavior. And my theory when I first started that about 10 plus years ago was that companies that were smart enough to know that they were better off taking care of their people, and I'll define that, would unlikely, would all likelihood be more profitable which was directly contradictory to Milton Friedman, who was Ronald Reagan's favorite economist, and who said the only legitimate purpose for business was to make money for shareholders, which is false. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what we set out to prove was if you had a bigger vision, you'd make even more money for shareholders. It just wouldn't be the goal. It'd be the outcome. And that's what we've been able to prove. So we started ranking these companies, as I say, about 10 years ago. For the first four and a half years, Forbes magazine was our partner. Okay. And they dedicated one issue a year to our findings. And then we signed up about three or four years ago with MSNBC. Mm-hmm. No, um, CNBC, excuse me, CNBC, the business channel. And they've been our partners ever since. And we do two or three, at least two or three inputs per month on their very shows. And they look at us as a kind of the go-to guys for, for this kind of information. But what we really did to prove it was we went to the toughest, most pragmatic, least philanthropic 
um, house on Wall Street, which is Goldman Sachs. I was going to say, who's that? It's Goldman Sachs. Okay. So Goldman doesn't do anything unless it makes money. They, they don't have an iliomocenary bone in their body. Wow, right? I didn't know that. Yeah. So we went there. And when I went there, my partner, the chairman, said, Arnaldo, why Goldman? I said, because if Goldman says it's so, no one's going to think they did it because they're green. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're not. Yeah. They do it because they make money. Yeah, they'll be shocked. <laughs> yeah. So we, it took us about a year to talk them into it. They did their own research. They concluded, we might be right. We might be onto something. So we started a thing called an ETF. Uh -huh. What does that stand for? Electronic traded fa funds. Okay. Electronic traded funds is like a, a collection of funds that are in an area and you buy the fund and it gives you the funds, the stocks of the funds. Right? So it's S &P like a, 500 is, yeah, is got it. Oh. And so we started it, the Just 100. And we put the 100 best stocks in. So every year we were Are you managing it. this? No, no. Goldman is. Goldman that, is. Okay. Yeah, Goldman is. Okay. Which is the beauty of it. Yeah. They created an ETF okay. for our Just 100. So they okay, took top it, 100 yeah. companies. Yeah. And they said, okay, we'll put a million dollars of partner capital in to try and see if it works. And okay. it did. Uh -huh. And so it was six, seven years later, they're still going strong. And still, uh -huh. it's still, we outperform measured by the return turn on the increase in share prices. So our companies always outperform the Russell index, which is about the same size. Mm -hmm. So if you take a public index run by public people, the same way every the public company thing is, they don't do as well as we do hmm. every year, year after year after year. So Goldman became a believer, not because they, they bought the religion, so to speak, yeah. because they could see the profitability. Uh -huh. And when you're outperforming the market substantially, Goldman pays attention. Yeah. And so it worked because if I'd have gone to one of my buddies in the in ESG funds, they might say, well, that's because those guys are they're greenies or they have their hearts on their sleeve or something. And mm -hmm. you do it with Goldman, they go, no, if Goldman says they're making money, they're making money. Mm -hmm. And they do. So the, the answer to the question I wanted to get to is my research shows that the number of people in corporations, both at the CEO level and the young people going into corporations, has actually increased they are more aware and more purpose-driven than the prior generation by far. So even though it is true, lots of people say, oh, business, I don't want to go into it. It's this, it's that. The truth is most people go into business. Hmm. And what they're doing is they're trading something that's more conscious, that they can align with, that gives them a sense of purpose than the higher salary they might get elsewhere. And it turns out our research says that's also smarter from a career point of view. Yeah. So why not work where you like it? In other words, why not, why not, I mean, if you go to work and you don't like where you work, what a, what a crazy waste, as I said earlier. Oh, yeah. I, you only get one time through, right? Yeah. Well, you got one it's life. not going to be very effective anyway. No, and you're yeah. not going to have any fun. Uh -huh. And you're going to live, you know, you're going to born, live and die. And what was it all about, Alfie? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it sort of leave you lacking. So to me, it's, it's really key that people recognize they have more freedom than they realize to pick where they put their body, their mind, and their heart and their soul. And once they pick that they're going to put it in a place that rewards them, they will find that they will prosper more than if they were on the sidelines, you know, screaming and shouting. Yeah. Well, you mentioned AI. Mm -hmm. Relating that to young people, I feel that it's affecting their critical thinking abilities. Maybe yes, maybe no. Let me explain. And maybe I shouldn't disclose my, my bias here. I, so I have a background in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I was recently awarded a patent for the most advanced form of robotic artificial intelligence. So some people could look at that and say, gee, is that replacing human labor? Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do for our jobs? And mm -hmm. I love to tell people that's exactly what the fear was of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So people went around in the early days of the Industrial Revolution breaking the machines. They were called Ludites. That was the name of their group. Mm -hmm. Because they felt that a job that the machine could do was one that a human should do, and therefore it was stealing jobs. Well, as we all know, the number of jobs got created by the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. overwhelmingly dwarfed the number of jobs it took. The type of job changed. Mm -hmm. We didn't need 10-year-old boys in coal mines anymore. Yeah. Right? We didn't need little girls running shuttlecocks back and forth in, in looming factories, mm -hmm. loom factories. So it, it, the fear that the technology will replace the human has always been around, and AI has just given it a new level of, of concern. So if you take and you go past the job issue, which I'm not worried about the job issue. In fact, if anything, I hope that AI gives us the ability to cut back on the work week. I think that the American, which is the longest in the world, the American work week, it's way too long. We, we should not be working more than 30 hours a week. And mm -hmm. if, if 10 of those hours get taken up by robots and creates enough wealth that we can afford to do it, hallelujah, Hollywood. Yeah. And if the robots create enough well-being 
that we can afford to have zero homeless in this country if it makes it so that nobody has to worry about medical care or or health care. <sighs> My goodness. Of course, I'd be happy to welcome it. But, but let me talk about the software itself, because your comment went to whether or not it was causing them to lose their capabilities to be discerning, right? Well, doing math, no, knowing how to write a sentence. Yeah. Okay. So knowing how to do research. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I, I, and I think I use this example tonight. In the hands of a surgeon, a scalpel will save a life. Mm-hmm. That same thing, a scalpel in the hands of a murderer will kill. What's the difference? Not the scalpel. It's the person using it. Okay. So we can't make scalpels illegal because we need to save lives with operations, which is not true for weapons. We don't need weapons to save lives. They only kill lives. But mm-hmm. putting that aside, the scalpel's there. Now, what I've discovered in my research and getting my patents and all with AI, and I do what's called generative AI as well as normal artificial intelligence, I think it's actually sharpening uh, reasoning skills. And here's why. When you weren't even born yet, no one had heard of the idea of a calculator, yeah. let alone one for $19, mm-hmm. right? That could do more than you could possibly do. When they came along, I was a young person at that mm-hmm. time. The fear was, oh my God, we'll forget our times tables. Mm-hmm. Well, what's the magic of a times table? It's just to get you to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. So if you can punch a couple of keys and get the absolute right answer, what you're really after is what's the answer to the problem? Not can you do two times two? Mm-hmm. Nobody cares if you can do two times two. Can you get the answer to the problem? That's important. Mm-hmm. So I believe that the, the generative AI skills can be abused. Absolutely. I'll give you an example. And there are good software programs that will detect it now. You tell this, any generative, any chat GPT, for example, you tell mm-hmm. chat GPT to write an essay for you mm-hmm. on any subject. Mm-hmm. There's a software program I can run. It'll tell me exactly how much you wrote and how much the computer wrote. Mm-hmm. And any professor can run it if he wants to. So if you're going to turn in a chat GPT, mm-hmm. You're going to get caught. It's just, it's just by math, math. It's all mathematics. Well, it's, it's, it's looking for algorithms. Yeah. So yeah. What, it, what it's telling you is this thing was not composed by a human. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, that software didn't exist a year ago. It does today. Mm-hmm. And any, anybody can afford to buy it. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, your professor at the local junior college can do it for his English class. Mm-hmm. So if people try to use chat GPT to avoid the responsibility of thinking original thoughts or writing original words... They're not going to succeed. They'll get caught. Conversely, if you use it the way I use it. So, for example, I just started using ChatGPT about mm, five months ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because I do all my own research. So when the Academy issues a paper, I've already done the research. I'm not going to go to ChatGPT and tell me what the science is on climate change. Mm -hmm. So I go into ChatGPT and I say, this is how I write. This is what I just wrote. Clean it up for me and see if I put, you know, all the right adverbs and pronouns and everything in the right places. Mm-hmm. And it gives me back choices. And I would say 70% of the time it, it writes it better, but it's still my writing. So mm-hmm. if you ran that through an, anal- an anal- analytical machine, it would say, oh, Bruco wrote that because oh, clearly I wrote it. Okay. So I don't use so it. It to- uses the same tone. Yeah. 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 In fact, I tell it, make it sound like me. But it can, okay. Yeah. Make make it sound like I wrote it. Don't don't change the sound of it. Mm-hmm. In fact, just this happened about, hey, gosh, three weeks ago. I wrote this really good article I liked and it was 2,800 words long, which is a lot younger, longer than I typically write them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, and I said, okay, well, I'm running through ChatGPT and it came back at 280 words. Two, how many? 280. For, versus 2,800? Yeah. 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 So clearly it made a mistake. Right. <laughs> So again, the human, not, so if I'd have been- How in, did that ha- happen? Because it's a computer. It, yeah. It makes mistakes just like we do, right? Yeah. And when it makes a mistake, it's a massive mistake because it doesn't know how to correct itself yeah. yet. That's coming. So anyway, the point of the story is, I go, oh my God. Okay. So we type in, you just blew it. Uh-huh. A, this doesn't sound like Ronaldo. And B, it was 2,800 words to start with. Make it come out about the same length. Don't try to cheat. <laughs> yeah. And it and came it, back at about 2,750. Okay. Yeah, and it only made a half a dozen changes. Yeah. Because it liked what I had there. And, and and it was a really interesting article. So And it was a complex article. So I think if you start out where you don't surrender authorship to the machine, if you maintain authorship, if it's your ideas. Like, for example, I just, uh, I've done a series of... Uh, 10 topics, uh, just f- finished the first one, and I gave the other 10 to the team. And I said, you pick the order which you want me to write these articles. Mm-hmm. And I don't care. I'm going to write on all of them. And then I wrote a paragraph about what each article would cover. 
Mm -hmm. so that people on my team can go, okay, let's do that one next. Yeah. And it's all under a series I call Electrons versus Molecules, a False Dichotomy, where I talk about the playoff between electricity and, and hydrogen. Well, <laughs> I just love it because I already know which one they're going to pick. Mm -hmm. And they'll call me, I get to taste Monday, yeah, I'll find out today uh, that's <laughs> what the next one is. All right. And then I'll go crank it out. Well, I'm not going to go say to the chat GPT, oh, the team picked this. Mm -hmm. Go write an article on it. Because mm -hmm. then you get in trouble. First of all, the research could be terrible. Mm -hmm. It can come up with terrible mistakes. Yes. And it, it might not even sound like you. It's, 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 no, yeah. it's like throwing darts. And I don't believe in it. I don't mm -hmm. believe we should surrender. So now where do I come back to it? If people use it as a tool mm -hmm. to improve their scholarship, to yes. improve their writing capability, their communications ability, um, I'm decent at speaking. But I, I don't, I've never thought that I was a great automatic writer. So to me, writing is rewriting. So I have to write a lot to get a piece out. Well, with ChatGPT, I write it once mm -hmm. and I run it through. It cleans up my mistakes. I can sometimes as few as two drafts and I'm done, yeah. which is huge because I'm a guy that used to do five, six drafts. Mm -hmm. So you, it's a good tool if you use it that way. Now, yeah. how about people's enthusiasm, kids? Well, I, there's laziness. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's one person being intelligent about how they're going to use Chat AI GPT. as a tool. Yeah. But a lot of times it's being used in a very... Uh, Lazy way, I guess. Of course. And, and and that's about, that's not about chat because GPT. Trying to avoid work. That's the human. Yeah. That's, what do you, how do you fix that? Well, I'm, you know, psychology is not my thing. Yeah. So I can't tell you how to fix humans, but I can say this. Most of the humans I run into, most, not all, would rather end up where I ended up than where they're headed right now. Mm hmm and so I just tell them it's real simple. Just, you know, follow your heart, work really hard, mm -hmm. and don't try to cut corners. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll end up where you are meant to be. Does that mean you're meant to be a multimillionaire? Not necessarily. Does it mean you're meant to be a street cleaner? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. It just means it'll be, yeah, there's that great quote, uh, follow your bliss. Yeah. Right? So if you follow your bliss, you'll end up doing what you love doing, and you'll do it so well that no one would have to pay you to do it, although you do get paid to do it. And what amazes me is that some jobs in our society get paid way too much to do what they do. Way, way too much. Yeah. CEOs particularly, but athletes are in that category. So, okay, that's a distortion in our system. Does it make them bad people for taking the money? Not necessarily, although I can make the case that many CEOs engineer the companies they run so that they will maximize their own personal gain through stock options. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. That's not moral to me. That's, that's predatory behavior. Mm -hmm. Boeing is a good example. You know, when Boeing merged with McDonnell Douglas, Boeing was the finest aircraft manufacturer in the world by far. Phenomenal corporate culture. If you didn't see it, there was a show Sunday morning today. Uh, yeah, Sunday morning on Sunday. So CBS, they did a great story on, on Boeing. Yeah. yeah, because Boeing, the day they merged with McDonald, that was the end of Boeing. Donald Douglas became a air, uh, um, basically a defense contractor. Oh, yeah. That's their business, military spending. And military contractors have a whole different ethos than commercial people. Uh -huh. So the management of McDonnell Douglas, which were military contractor people, they came in and they destroyed the culture of Boeing. This is what CBS covered this mm -hmm. yesterday. Great story. And true. I remember seeing it at the time. Yeah. I remember seeing Boeing get acquired going, oh, my God, the best aircraft company in the world just got acquired by the rapacious, mm -hmm. the, rapa the rapacious people. Mm -hmm. And the story correctly points out that's what did Boeing in. It was the culture they destroyed. And they destroyed it because they want to increase short-term profits, mm -hmm. stockholder buybacks. You have a term called being a stakeholder as mm -hmm. opposed to yeah. this the shareholder model. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? So the shareholder model is is shareholder supremacy. The only reason to be in business is to make money for shareholders. Mm -hmm. The stakeholder model says you're in business to serve all your stakeholders. And your stakeholders, the order I would put them in, you might have a different order. Number one, your employees. Mm -hmm. That's that's your team. That's That's your family. Mm -hmm. Number two, your vendors, the people who sell you stuff that you sell to other people. Mm -hmm. And I've learned over the years by taking care of your vendors, they really take care of you. Mm -hmm. Number three, you have clearly, you've got share owners. Mm -hmm. Number four, you've got people who are involved in your enterprise because they live in the communities that you serve. And you want to be very careful to not pollute the pool of humanity that you are serving because then they won't be there to sell to just really selfishly smart. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, you want to do something that will preserve the biosphere and not destroy it Yeah, because a destroyed biosphere is not good for business. Mm -hmm. Yours or anybody else's. Yeah. 
So to me, it's really simple. Stakeholders are all those categories. And when you when you try to take care of all of them and you don't put shareholders on the top, the shareholders come out better. And that's mm-hmm. what we proved with the ETF that Goldman runs. Who's in those? Who's in the ETF? Well, every year it changes. You have to be one of the top 100 companies in America from a point of view of what the public thinks is a just behavior. Is there a company that seems to be on the in, included in that category? There, yeah, there are a number of them. And, and, and it's, what's surprising is that some of the companies that get in, get in in, um, in a way you would never expect. So Bank of America went through a tremendous uh, bloodletting about three years ago. They just fired all kinds of people. Yeah. Because they decided to go to a tellerless model. So they want, and if you've been to a bank of America lately, you, you get in line to talk to somebody to set an appointment. Really? <laughs> yeah. They don't, have, they don't have banks and tellers like that. Really? Like, no. Okay. No. So, um, but in the, in the, and so they redid their entire structure so that they have a uh, little private offices now and you get an appointment for somebody to talk to somebody about a home loan or appointment, about a car loan, et cetera. And there's very few people there just, you know, cash and checks. And so much of it is done electronically now, of course. Mm-hmm. So from your phone too. Yeah, yeah, and it's all gone electronic. So what's happened is the number of people employed at Bank of America has dropped dramatically. Well, since the number of people dropped dramatically, the average salary went up dramatically. So B of A ended up in first position two years ago really? for the average pay to its employees because they fired so many people uh-huh. that were underpaid. Now, that's not a good way to get to the top of the rankings, but yeah. it's what... what is the criteria? In that case, the criteria is uh, pay, pay equity. In other words... How well do you take care of your employees financially? So okay. pay equity, and that's the number one criteria in the just index is like oh, okay. we look at pay equity. So when I started it, I thought we'd find that people were going to get really mad with CEO compensation because I was mad at it. Yeah. But it turns out if you get a lot, you make a ton of money as a CEO, but you take care of your employees, no one's mad. If you, no matter what you make, if you don't take care of your employees, everybody's mad. Mm-hmm. And the idea of treating employees like modern day serfs just isn't acceptable anymore. In fact, major companies, Walmart, Amazon, have learned that the hard way. They have to learn, and they have learned, they have to take care of their people, their people are going to turn on them, which they did. And so being smart business people, they decide, oh, okay, the best way to make money is to have my customers like me. What a concept. Yeah. Take boardrooms. So when I was a kid coming into the business world, it was all old boy, old boy network, mm-hmm. 100%. Yes. And there was nothing about talent or anything. It was just like, you're a vote I can count on and I'll do that for you over here. You do that for me over here. And it's all a bunch of backslapping, pretty much white male figures. That's been changing, probably not as fast as it should, but it's been changing pretty fast. Mm-hmm. And you have uh, companies you'd never be, you'd be surprised at some of the companies like Intel, for example, which is an engineering company. I think the board is 50% female now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... It, Changes come faster to corporate America than the public has realized. Mm. And there's still a huge chunk of corporate America that's way behind the eight ball. But my point earlier is it's better now than it was 20, 30 years ago. And as far as young people's incentivization, you know, I, I, I believe that young people will respond like people have for millennia. I don't think that the DNA has changed. Mm. I actually wanted to talk to you about the 360 degrees of consciousness yeah. approach. Yeah. Well, that, that talk was about how you can't just look in front of yourself and you can't just look behind or to the sides or up or down. You got to look everywhere. Yes. Because okay? you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, and that's what 360 degree consciousness is. It's staying alert. I think yeah. is what I described it as. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you seem really passionate about politics. Well, because at this point in time, that's the biggest issue. My biggest passion is actually climate change. And and I think my place uh, is to do what I do, which is to uh, try to do convey as many technologies as I can that can ease the way to sustainable living. Mm-hmm. Well, most of my podcasts have been very hopeful. Well, yeah, no, I'd love to be hopeful. First yeah. of all, remember, I published the, and everybody said, well, please get a free copy. We publish the Optimist Daily as part of the Academy's public service. And we send out, you know, two, three stories a day of something very positive that you mm-hmm. didn't know mm-hmm. that is happening somewhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And they're short stories. And we always will give people citations so they can look at to do it deeper because mm-hmm. we don't ask you to take our word for it. But it's full of positive optimistic. And one of the reasons I've been publishing it is because it's the antidote. Mm-hmm. I think it's a balance. It's So the, the optimism I have is I think we can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, what I believe is to be as analytical as I can with an open heart, because if you're just analytical and you don't have your heart open, you become a very cold person mm-hmm. and you can do very cold things to other yeah. people. 
But with your heart open and a highly analytical approach, you can discover solutions that give you new ways to hope and, 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 and hold out for a better tomorrow. Yeah. I personally believe, and I want to get people out to, on the record of this, the job of every sentient conscious human being is to lubricate the transition to the world we want to be in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. what you got to do. You got you to be willing to, how do I help grease the skids yeah. so we can get to the world I want to be in, yeah. not the world I found myself in. So your Republican friends, how do you communicate with them? Well, most of the Republicans I know have already dropped their party affiliation. Mm-hmm. I'm not a Democrat. Yeah, I haven't I'm been a Democrat either. in 36 years, 40 years. I've been independent all that time. Same here, yeah. yeah, and I've voted for some Republicans mm-hmm. and I voted for a lot of Democrats. But mm-hmm. no, I think that the... If you take a Republican, Liz Cheney, for example, Matt Kitzinger, I think they're right on. I like yeah. them. And I would have no trouble talking to them mm-hmm. because they're Republicans, which means they I don't necessarily agree with their conservative political philosophy, but I agree with their right to say it. And they're doing it in a way that's non-threatening to me and our society. Yeah. I don't really get involved politically you better right? than, because it's always the lesser of two evils. No, no, not necessarily. And I think that's I not true. No, I, I don't think either. that. I don't think that's true. I don't think we have a choice of good people often enough, but you can't put someone, for example, like Barack Obama up and say he's the lesser of two evils. Mm-hmm. You can't say that about Jimmy Carter. Mm-hmm. Who certainly was never the lesser of two evils. You can't say that about, I don't even think about Joe Biden unless he doesn't step down. So I, I think that it's, that's an unfair position. And I think what it does by washing your hands of the process, mm-hmm. you are walking away from the control over your own life. Think yeah. about that. Think pe- people have to wake up. This is serious now. We- I am paying attention, but usually I don't like to get involved. Well, who does? It's not my job. It's not my business. Yeah. I love to talk about science. I love to talk about consciousness. Mm-hmm. Look at the, the, the Supreme Court decision. Do, do you know how big a decision the Chevron case was? Yeah. So the Chevron was bigger than Roe v. Wade being reversed. Chevron said after 100 years, the courts will choose whether or not they want to have the FDA supervise drugs, whether they want the FAA to stop supervising airlines. So they want to dismantle the entire federal bureaucracy. That's nuts. That is pure crazy, mm-hmm. but that's exactly what the uh, 2025 project says. Okay. Mm-hmm. So gutting all of our democratic institutions is in the heart of that 900 page document. Well, I haven't read everything, but T- Kennedy's stance is that a lot of those institutions are corrupt and they're taking bribes. I, yeah. yeah I, I, the problem just... with that is, <laughs> yeah, the problem with that, and I know Bobby fairly well. In fact, I can honestly say, and if he was listening right now, I'd tell you this is the truth. He asked me to join his board. Okay. okay? So I know Bobby fairly well. Uh-huh. And I turned him down. And the reason I turned him down is because Bobby has his own mind made up about everything before he hears the facts, He's, Okay, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. So even though his people wanted me to join the board and he wanted me to join the board mm-hmm. and we spent a whole day together alone talking about it, it became clear to me that I could not help him. Mm-hmm. And I don't waste my time talking to people who I can't help. Yes. So it's not that I, I, I don't, I don't have a a person in the world that I don't like. In other words, I, a person could be a Trumpy. My, my family's a Trumpy. Mm-hmm. But I, I, there's just nothing there for me to talk about that's going to be useful to them or me, because mm-hmm. that's what you were asking earlier. Mm-hmm. So I don't try. It's yeah. like I don't force my ideology on somebody who doesn't want to hear. Whatever the fearless leader says is what it is. Okay, you, you, there's no talking to these people. Mm-hmm. That they, they've, got, they've got their reality set. Mm-hmm. So you can work around it, yeah. but you can't convince them to do something rational. That's not in the game. So the question is, is that okay with us? Mm-hmm. Now, do I want to do politics? No, that's yeah. not what I'm here to do. I'm what here about, to business What Academy. about mayor? Can you do that? <laughs> mayor. Mayor of Santa Barbara. I think it better, I think, I, I think it better stay, uh, uh, just stick to my knitting, which is science. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for, for the vote of confidence. <laughs> but no, you know, and, and I want to leave this with any of your listeners that are here, that, that are listening, who, you know, lean towards Trump or whatever they think I'm being unfair well, to. I'm, I'm not taking any sides. No, no, <laughs> no, no, I, no, no yeah. I am. And that's uh-huh. what I'm saying yeah. is that's not my normal style. Yeah. My normal style is not to have to. Uh-huh. And so what I'm trying to do is to challenge everybody within the sound of my voice, please wake up. This is mm-hmm. not normal. This is, this is the height of abnormal. I just mentioned the Chevron decision, which reversed a uh-huh. hundred years, the row, mm-hmm. 50 years. Mm-hmm. And, and as you know, they're going after contraception now. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're, they're going to get rid of myth Meta- Meta- of Princeton for sure. It's like, this is nuts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Why is it that women can't control their own bodies? Mm-hmm. I thought we, we got over that a few years ago. Yeah. Right. I- 
So I let's do another interview. It has nothing to do with politics or Trump. But when, when that, <laughs> I, when, I know. I'm trying to figure out what should I do with this. Is this concern heightened because of what happened with the debate? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, the, because because what the debate pointed out is that we got a we got a very fundamental problem. Yeah. And we got to fix it. And if we don't fix it, the whole and by the way, it's, I'm not just you know, there isn't a major world leader that isn't looking at this thing with the same with oh my the same God. concern. <laughs> no, they all. And I'll tell you, what, you want me to come back on the show? We'll do it, and we won't talk any politics at all. And we'll talk about three hundred okay. sixty degrees of conscience, whatever else. But I felt when you asked the questions, uh huh, and I'm trying to be honest about what's really on my mind and why. Yes, it's sort of like I'm standing I, here looking at a forest fire, and I'm going, "You want me to talk about the? <laughs> you want me to talk about what's in my garden?" <laughs> that's true. I get that. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been really interesting. And different, huh? <laughs> different. <laughs> I. This is all stuff I would probably talk to you about off record more than on record. Why? But, but well, I like I said, I haven't really been involved with politics. I I've heard sound bites. But I can't make a decision based on sound okay. bites. So if you believe in 360 degree consciousness, now yeah. it's your obligation to go get informed. Yeah, I have been paying attention a little bit. I'm watching interviews yeah. with but that's, Kennedy and but so that's 360 you know, degree consciousness. Seeing different perspectives. That's 360 degrees of uh, consciousness. Watching how please what's ha- what's happening with the Supreme Court. And, and no one's got permission to. Uh, this is not a. Uh, this is not a spectator sport. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I think there's a lot of people that are not paying attention at all. I know, which is why I am. And they're going to vote. Yeah, and I'm, that's why I'm talking. I'm hoping that they will listen and start to get engaged. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in democracy. I believe that one woman, one man, one vote, mm-hmm. regardless of, you know, sex, birth. I'm an immigrant. Most people don't know that. Mm-hmm. So I'm a big believer that immigrants built this country mm-hmm. and destroying the immigrant uh Culture is just crazy. It's what made us. Mm -hmm. But that's what's going on. So to me, if we don't talk about what's really important Mm -hmm. and we pretend like it's it's like the elephant in the living room, Mm -hmm. not so good. I I just got in a little bit of trouble for doing that recently in a hearing in in Sacramento because someone asked me, assemblyman, a friend of mine actually, asked me a question. I thought he wanted me to answer it. (laughs) I didn't know it was a setup. (laughs) <laughs> and so I answered it honestly and it turned out it was a mistake Yeah. because what I did is I said oh here's the white elephant in the living room and we talked about it a little bit and they oh my god doesn't he know that's not what's going on here uh-huh. so then afterwards I found out I mean I figured it out during the hearing oh I get it this was a, this was a kabuki and I was like out of character for the mm-hmm. play I was in so it's when you're not a politician or a political person it's easy to get trapped into that but that doesn't relieve me or any of your listeners from the responsibilities to pay attention and care well, I do feel that now that I we had your perspective, that I should have somebody go for else's it. perspective. Go for now it. I got to figure out who that's going to be. I don't even know, go. but I, I'm just curious. Have you seen the Doctor Phil interviews? No, he's I've, interviewing I've seen some everybody. Of them. I don't think he's got had Biden yet, but <laughs> it's been interesting. I don't know if he leans politically in one direction. He though. leans right. I understand. He does. Yeah. Okay, but you know, I mean, that's not the reason I haven't seen him. Just I didn't get time to see him. It's like yeah. how much time was the one having there in their yeah. day? Yeah, yeah. But no, I just think go get as much opinion as you want, but give, give me somebody who will justify turning row over. Yeah. Tell me why that makes sense. Yeah, I know. Tell me why the Chevron case makes sense. Tell me why it makes sense that Clarence Thomas doesn't recuse himself on cases where he's, his, his clients have paid him bribes to decide those cases. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Alito. Do you know, what, uh, not, do you know what Thomas Jefferson said? Listen to this. You ready? The price of liberty okay, is an informed citizenry. If you're not willing to get informed, mm-hmm. you're not going to be free. And so what we have to do is wake everybody up, say, okay, we were just got on, on, on automatic. We thought it was all going to be fine. Like, oh, tomorrow will be like yesterday. No, mm-hmm. that's not true. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, we've got these huge challenges and we got to wake up. Mm-hmm. We've been sonambulant. We've been sleepwalking. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm trying to do with, whether I'm talking about 360 degree consciousness yeah. or whether I'm talking about what are we going to do to save the Republic or whether we're talking about how it is that young people are going into business and making really good decisions, a lot of them. And mm-hmm. it's the popular but all press that stuff doesn't matter. This matters. The most. Not, yeah. Exactly. Right? It's the core. And then as things change, the core changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. And you just gave me, I know what I'm going to start the podcast with is with that quote. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. 
Ronaldo's passion and commitment to community service are both evident and inspiring, offering us his perspective on the challenges and possibilities we face today. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, my original intent was to focus on the presentation he gave on 360 degrees of consciousness. I had no intention of delving into politics, and the views expressed by Ronaldo do not necessarily reflect mine. However, things don't always go as expected, and given recent events, it provided an opportunity to reflect on this moment with the 360-degree perspective that Rinaldo introduced. I debated whether to publish this podcast, since any form of politics is not the tone of my show. It's natural to have differing political views, but it's important to address these differences calmly and respectfully, always keeping in mind our shared humanity. So... I'm sharing this podcast with you with the hope that we can all work together to build a better country for everyone. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for more episodes where we continue to celebrate the amazing people and stories that make our community vibrant. To learn more about the 360 Degrees of Consciousness, please visit the World Business Academy YouTube channel and look for the 360 Degrees Talk. The link will be in my podcast description. For more information about Ronaldo, Just Capital, and the World Business Academy, please visit worldbusiness.org. Don't forget to follow, share, and like this podcast.